Welcome to Istota Rzeczy. I'm Marcin Pasierbski. In our program, we talk with intellectuals, artists and creators on fundamental topics, trying to grasp the essence of things. And my today's guest is Professor David Engels, historian and philosopher of history. Hello. Hello, thank you for the invitation. Just a short introduction, David. Uh, since 2018, uh, he is a professor in the Department of Roman History at uh, Free University of Brussels, ULB. Uh, the focus of his research interest is on the history of Roman religion, the Seleucid state, comparative historical research, history of reception and philosophy of history. Professor Engels is an expert on Oswald Spengler's thought. He is one of the founders of Oswald Spengler Society. Since 2018, he is also a researcher in the Institute for Western Affairs, Institut Poznański, uh, where he is responsible for issues related to Western intellectual history, uh, as well as European identity and Polish-Western um, relations. Professor Engels is the author of several books, for instance, Renovatio Europe, uh, and the new one, uh, Kefer, uh, in Polish it's uh, Corobić, which is, according to your words, survival guide for lovers of Europe. He is also a publicist and essayist uh, in French, German, as well as Polish magazines. David, the first question. Uh, you're Belgian with a deep understanding of uh, French and uh, German culture, philosophy, history, etc. Since 2018, uh, you are also immersed in uh, Polish culture and Polish intellectual life. Uh, so taking into account your unique experience of uh, knowing and understanding uh, those three different cultures, Uh, your theoretical background, as well as uh, practical experience as an observer, as an uh, analyst, as a uh, citizen. Uh, how would you say, uh, what are the differences between Polish, German and French conservatisms? Uh, what are the differencia specifica of those three political philosophies, but also uh, political practice? Yeah, that's a difficult question because uh, somehow as a, a Belgian, I, I feel a foreigner a bit everywhere. Huh? I'm, I, I'm, even though I'm, I'm German and French speaking, I, I do not feel being a German or French uh, uh, person. Of course, living here in Poland is also an additional very um, interesting experience. And of course, if we want to compare French, German, uh, uh, Polish conservatism, we, we ought to ask, of course, what do we mean by conservatism? Because something that I'm realizing more and more during these last years is the fact that conservatism is all but but monolithical. There are so many different streams in conservatism in different countries, but also in Europe, that the comparison is very difficult. Nevertheless, I would say that there are two different strands. On, on the one hand, we have a, let's say, more liberal conservative and liberal national conservatism in France, in Germany, partly also in Polish, uh, based on things like in, in, in France, for example, the idea of the Republic, so it's constructed against the ancient regime, the idea of laicity also, which is also constructed, of course, against Christianity, but which is still considered somehow as being uh, conservative. For example, if you look at the Rassemblement National, many people uh, deemed conservative, sometimes even right or far right, are uh, ardent defenders of the valeur républicaine, of the republic, uh, uh, of uh, laicité, and that kind of thing. In Germany, uh, you have also conservatism that is uh, uh, more and more based on, on Protestant values, for example, a specific branch also that is often linked to a certain branch of liberalism also. Um, and then, of course, in, in Poland, even though uh, much less prominent, uh, there is also this, uh, let's say, liberal strand of people uh, like in Confederatia, for example, who are more uh, nearer to Ayn Rand's philosophy uh, of uh, uh, objectivism and that kind of thing. And so, of course, it's very difficult to bring these people 
together around common common values and, 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 and common ground. Of course, there are values like the Enlightenment, which is shared a bit everywhere. But the problem with these rationalist and liberal values is that on the one hand, yes, they manage to give a new light to uh, universal rights, to human dignity, and so forth. And very often, they also really succeeded in, in, in surpassing uh, social, spiritual, political injustices in the 18th and 19th century. However, they are constructed also to the same amount, the same part, I would say, on the deconstruction of uh, European tradition. So they are very often uh, um, directed against the Christian underpinning of our family. They also have a very liberal view very often on family and so forth. And so even though they often consider themselves as being conservatives and opposed to cancel culture, to cultural Marxism and so forth, nevertheless, they uh, do not dare to go back to tradition, but rather want to conserve artificially a certain state of society like we have headed in Western Europe in the 1980s, something like that. That is their conservatism. They want to go back to that. So they fight, for example, also the risk of Islamization of Europe, not in the name of Christianity, but rather in the name of free values and uh, free uh, evolution for everyone as he wishes it without any form of restriction from a religious point of view. So that's the liberal strand. And it's difficult to, to bring these people together. There's another strand. And I think I think this is a strand I, I see much more uh, present in, in Poland, in Hungary also, many, uh, let's say, Eastern countries within the European Union. And this, this uh, orientation is rather based on Europe's uh, Christian tradition. So it doesn't start with enlightenment of the 18th century, but it uh, embraces uh, also the Middle Ages. It sees that uh, Christianity, that our very specific Western view of the family, that our uh, realization that uh, Europe is not just a continent, but a civilization that deeply belongs together since the adventure of uh, the Carolingian uh, uh, period uh, is also important. And so um, these people, of course, throughout Europe are much more compatible. And I have to say that also uh, the number of people trying to base a certain form of uh, patriotism on these shared historical values is growing more and more in France, in Germany perhaps a little, a little bit less, in Poland uh, as well as in Hungary this let's say more historical, more traditionalist approach towards identity is very present in, in the political sphere. That is one of the reasons why I'm quite happy also to live here in Poland as such a position which as I said in, in Germany, even in Belgium is very in the minority, is quite present here in Poland. So this impression that there is something more than just liberal values and the nation state but that there is something like a Western civilization we are part of but which and which we need to defend and that this Western civilization is inseparable from Christian uh, transcendence, from Christian view on family, on politics, on social ethics uh, and so forth. So there is a huge variety of different people terming themselves or considering themselves as conservatives and that is also why it is so difficult to somehow bring them together to uh, a mutual understanding, even more so as of course uh, there are still uh, many, uh, let's say, historical political resentments everywhere, in Poland obviously, towards Germany, towards Russia, which is absolutely understandable given the history of the last centuries, but also in Germany, uh, the war trauma, which is very present, and also in France, where there is still this, 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 uh, this impression that the Napoleonian uh, Empire or that the uh, France of uh, Louis the Fourteenth is still something people are nostalgic about. And so bringing these different national identities and often national mutual resentments together uh, is a huge task, but a task that is absolutely necessary if Europe wants to, to protect its, uh, its civilization during this and the next centuries. Speaking of uh, Western tradition uh, and Western identity, uh, you are promoting uh, the idea or the concept of hesperialism. This notion is not very or commonly known uh, in Polish intellectual life. Could you explain what hesperialism is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with pleasure. Of 
course, the term, the, 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 the notion of Hesperialism itself uh, refers to the Greek word Hesperos. Um, that is uh, the uh, reference to the utmost west of the known world. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a term um, that uh, I have uh, coined uh, in, in opposition to things like Europeanism, which is often considered as uh, some uh, uncritical uh, fan club attitude towards the European Union, or, or, or Westernism, or Occidentalism, as opposed to Orientalism. I didn't want to use these, these terms, which are already well known, so I coined the term Hesperialism. Uh, and uh, the, the, the meaning is uh, uh, double. On, on the one hand, um, the, the, the first main idea uh, is that of a uh, cultural and political European patriotism. That is this idea that, the, 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 that Europe needs to be united in the 21st century in order to oppose the threat of Russia, of China, of, of uh, Muslim uh, fundamentalism, of mass migration uh, from Africa uh, and so forth. Europe needs somehow to, to work together tightly in order to, to, to survive. Um, the, the, the conditions of the 19th century, where Europe was just divided into a very small number of huge nation states, uh, like Austria, Hungary, which wasn't a nation state, but I mean as a, as a, as a big state or empire, or, or, or the German Empire or France, or, or, or Italy, uh, this time uh, when, when there was just a restricted number of states which had a huge demographic and technological advance in comparison to the rest of the world and who dominated entirely Africa and Asia, uh, this time is long gone. In the 19th century, the nation state or this, this form of statehood uh, could be considered as being sufficient in order to protect European civilization and to make it uh, blossom. Today, with more than 30 little nation states confronted to huge rising empires such as China or threats, like I said, from the Muslim world or from Africa, these 30 states do not suffice anymore. So we need to, get, to, to work together, not necessarily in form of the European Union, uh, as uh, the European Union and especially its leading ideology can be considered rather as an enemy to the true heart of Europe than, than its promoter. But we need to find at least alternative forms of working together. So the first idea is that we need a, a cultural and political European patriotism. We need to realize that the, the interests even of the European nation states can only be defended within some form of, of cooperation and that it stands and fall, falls with the others. The other uh, correlating aspect in, in Hesperialism is that such a new Europe needs to be grounded on cultural conservatism. It, it shouldn't be grounded on uh, leftist liberalism, cultural Marxism, cancel culture, LGBTQ culture, and so forth, which is rather destroying what remains of European civilization than, than again, uh, um, than again uh, um, stabilizing it. We need rather to go back to our roots, to rediscover our past, which is still shaping our identity, and we need to develop a positive and, and a constructive uh, relationship to Christian morality, to traditional family, to the social teaching also of the church. All these elements which have shaped European history for centuries and centuries and which we are just uh, throwing overboard for the moment need to be reintegrated again and need to be used again as a foundation for European unification. Without them, Europe doesn't have any, any, any future. Without a, a traditionalist and, and, and let's say constructively conservative approach towards what it means to be European, uh, Europe is deemed to, to be destroyed. And that is exactly what is happening. So that was one of the aim of, of the two books uh, you, you also alluded to in, in, in your introduction. So we tried to present this idea of, of, of Hesperialism in, uh, first in a book uh, called uh, Renovatio uh, Europae, published uh, by now in uh, quite a lot of different European languages also. Uh, uh, in Polish, and then of course in my newest book, whose whose, whose Polish uh, uh, translation or version is unfortunately already sold out, so we have to, to to wait for the next edition, which is called Europa Eterna. We have tried with with many co-authors to. Um, 
to, to propose a, a, a preamble to a future constitution of a European Confederation, a preamble which again defines what should be considered as European values and to what degree uh, such a European uh, cooperation needs to, to defend these values. So this is some form of, let's say, not of a contradictory program to the Lisbon Treaty, but rather as the necessary Uh, correlation, correlation, the necessary uh, complementary uh, program, trying that, yes, we need, of course, to defend uh, universal values, but we need to, to, to ground them again uh, and to base them again on our uh, historical tradition in order, to, uh, in order that uh, quite vague terms like democracy, uh, equality, uh, rule of law uh, have a sense. But because without any form of, of transcendent and historical anchoring, these terms can be interpreted uh, as, um, as, as everyone wants it and any passing majority uh, can uh, turn them upside down and uh, 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 turn them into the exact contrary, which is what is happening for the moment within the European Parliament, unfortunately. I would say you have presented the tragic alternative uh, that if Europe uh, Will, uh, if, if Europe uh, does not stick to you know, the rules and values, to the transcendent anchoring and so on, then it will not survive. Uh, so my question is, uh, if it's not a uh, utopian way of thinking to try to restore you know, the uh, Europe that has already gone uh, due to, you know, technological changes, due to economic, mental changes, uh, that actually we are not able to restore the order that has already passed. Don't you think it's a way, you know, a utopian way of thinking, which is actually not very conservative, because as we know, conservatives are very skeptical of uh, such uh, utopian way of thinking. So how would you respond to that question? Yeah, that's absolutely a justified, uh, justified question. I would say on, on the first hand uh, that we do not have any other choice. If we are really convinced about our values, if we are convinced that Europe stands or falls with its uh, Christian identity finally and its uh, constructive attitude towards its history, uh, then, then we need to defend these ideals, even if we know that they do not have any future. So we, we do not have any alternative. It's our duty to defend them. And even if we know that we will uh, finally even go under because of that, then sometimes it's better to go under with good ideals than survive but while selling your own soul. So I would say that there isn't any alternative to that. But on the other hand, uh, I, I would also be more, uh, let's say, uh, more optimistic. Uh, because uh, if we look into, into history, we see uh, different aspects which can instill a little bit of optimism. Um, we see, for example, many nations uh, which have managed during their, their histories to reinvent and recreate themselves out of their historical past. Poland is, an, is a magnificent example, for example, of, 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 of a nation that has managed during these last two, three hundred years to reinvent itself again and again. While many people said, no, the idea of a Polish nation state is uh, not Uh, uh, not valid anymore, be happy to be under Prussian or Austrian or, or, or Prussian uh, administration uh, uh, and so forth. Many Poles said, no, we want to recreate our Polish state, we want to stick to our identity, we want to readapt uh, um, or we want to recreate a nation state that is based on these values which we have defended for many generations even under foreign occupation. So Poland managed to, 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 to be an, a perfect example how uh, um, recreating one's identity and, and one's political solidarity uh, out of pure, uh, let's say, uh, pure love to one's past uh, and one's clinging to tradition is possible. Think also about China. There are things like Confucianism in China, which time and again for hundreds, if not thousands of years, have been rediscovered again and again in order to... to um, 
to, to base this state again on its own history, on its own tradition. And even after the Cultural Revolution of Mao, when it seemed that uh, uh, the ancient culture of China was definitely uh, destroyed uh, once and for all, uh, we see that now, barely 50 years later, uh, some form of cultural conservatism uh, uh, is absolutely possible and is even now defended by the so-called Communist Party, which wants to, once again, to, to tie itself back to the uh, age-old uh, cultural uh, traditions of China. So <clears throat> these are examples that show uh, that uh, we shouldn't uh, think that Christianity, Christian values, cultural traditionalism uh, is dead one, once and for all. The other approach would be uh, more based on cultural comparatism. You already alluded uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm deeply interested in, uh, in Oswald Spengler, uh, Toynbee also, uh, Hegel, Vico. Uh, so all thinkers that try to parallelize different civilizations in order to show that there are parallel mechanics and dynamics that underpin all these civilizations and that make it possible uh, also to somehow predict their future evolution. Evolution, right? Because if you see that uh, 10 or 20 civilizations in the past have a, a similar evolution, uh, then there is a certain probability that the 21st or 15th or whatever uh, will behave in a quite similar way. And looking at past history, uh, we see that uh, all civilizations towards their end uh, go through a phase of deep identity crisis uh, that is then finally uh, surpassed by some form of conservative revolution, of tying politics back, not to the history of the last 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years, but going back to the beginning. That is, for example, exactly what Augustus did uh, when he founded the Roman Principate, that he tried to say, okay, well, the old the, 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 the Republic, the Senatorial Republic is dead, now we need to go back to the founding period of Rome, to the founding period of the Roman Republic. Uh, we see similar events also when the Chinese uh, Qin and Han Empire were founded, uh, when the Sasanian uh, when the Sasanians under Khosrowes, for example, refounded their empire and so forth. You can, can look at all civilizations towards the end. There is this wish to tie history back to the beginning and to create, perhaps artificially, but still responding to deep longing, to tie it back to its origin and to recreate somehow a tradition, sometimes uh, even very creatively, and to adapt it, of course, to the political and also technological necessities of the um, of the present. And so that is why I sometimes speak also about a, a Carolingian uh, revolution or Carolingian reform that could be needed for Europe in order once again to go back to the spirit of its founding years and its its founding period in order to, to, to reinvent itself and take example of sometimes very ancestral institutions in order to find new solutions how to, to bypass uh, this, uh, this dead end uh, into which the European Union seems to have uh, seems to have led us. So this vision that you are presenting, which corresponds with uh, Hegel's, Toynbee's, uh, Spengler's view, uh, is um, based on certain anthropology. This anthropology assumes that people uh, need to have uh, some fundamental values. And it's not possible actually to live in some kind of vacuum, uh, a nihilistic vacuum without any axiology and so on. So only if we accept such anthropology, which by the way, we think it's true, and conservatives do agree that it's an adequate uh, vision of human nature, uh, we can say and we can predict the, the future in a dynamics you have presented. If we, for example, assume different anthropology, more, let's say, progressive or, you know, the one that left is trying to promote, then uh, they probably will not agree with such, you know, vision of, of history, okay? So what they do is they assume the let's say, positive anthropology uh, and in this kind of vision the history will look uh, definitely uh, di differently. So, so I think that the first condition uh, of, of such a vision 
to say it's true is to accept cer certain, some fundamental anthropological assumptions. And if we do not accept it, then, then this vision probably will not accept uh, that it's mm -hmm. true, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Even though <coughs> this uh, modern leftist, <coughs> leftist position on um, anthropology, on identity, on individuality uh, in itself uh, uh, is also something that recurs uh, quite frequently in history. If we look, for example, at the uh, late Roman Republic, which uh, was uh, one of the subject, I would say, of my first more, more well-known uh, books uh, um, on the path towards empire, which, which, by the way, will be published uh, during the next weeks, I guess, even in the uh, completely revised Polish translation also. Uh, in, in, in this book, I tried to show how the, the present identity crisis of the West broadly resembles the one that the late Roman Republic in the first century BC uh, also had to pass through. So um, things like uh, radical individualism, like um, the uh, disinterest in religion uh, and uh, the, the decline of traditional religion coupled with some form of materialism and radical individualism and hedonism is also something we see in the first century. Uh, we see in the first century also the crisis of the of the family, where, for example, demography is uh, plumbing uh, and where the divorce rate is exploding because people want to develop themselves instead of clinging to, to the limits, of course, that are imposed by, by, by family. We see also a disinterest in, in even Roman history and Roman identity. Cicero once said that he and his contemporaries uh, went uh, and walked through Rome like strangers and foreigners within their own city because they didn't know anymore about their past, about their collective identity, uh, and so forth. There was also even this attitude by many Roman intellectuals that uh, uh, if the Roman Empire of the Republic was to be a just empire, then it needed to dismantle itself uh, and uh, leave all the provinces into, uh, into, into liberty and, uh, uh, and freedom. So also a certain attitude of, of criticism of one's own history. So if we go through all these... Um, <laughs> patterns and <clears throat> aspects of uh, today's identity crisis, we see that they are recur recurring features also of, uh, of history. Nevertheless, <clears throat> they, um, nevertheless, they also um, show, I think, a fundamental distinction which is also important in itself. That is, that while people live within a civilization, while they are still somehow affected by, you could say, the virus of civilization that is wanting to cling to a certain path and, and continue to develop a certain leading idea that defines their history, they are, they are within a certain, let's say, a certain, a certain framework. But uh, towards the end of a civilization and before, of course, also, uh, people drop out more and more of, of this framework. They are disinterested in their past. They think that their civilization is something that doesn't belong to them. Uh, they just want to have basically fun uh, to develop themselves, consume some nice things, do their, their little career patterns, uh, but without any interest, let's say, in their collective identities. They, they become post-historical beings uh, and uh, become, yeah, this, this interested in their past. They cease to be historical beings. They become like Nietzsche's last man, a bit like Fukuyama's uh, last man too. And that is something uh, we see in all late civilizations and that is rising now. For leftism, this is a good thing. Uh, but of course for conservatives, uh, this is the sign that our civilization is weakening and weakening and that the number of people that are still belonging to this civilization and um, who want to defend it, is, is shrinking. And that is a process uh, which in the long run uh, uh, will be lost for us, as, as this is the case in every civilization. In the end, the number of people who want to hold it up is decreasing it. In the end, uh, there, there isn't anyone left. So in the long run, we will, of course, lose that fight. But not necessarily now, not necessarily in this generation, but perhaps in 100 or 200 years, there is still some time left. And this, let's say, final unification of our civilization around traditional uh, conservative values uh, has happened in every civilization and is still possible in our civilization, even though it will be some form of, of final dot 
at the end of our civilization. But that is still our task, I think, to, to put that final dot. So you are an example, I would say a rare example of a uh, optimistic conservative, like from, you know, the optimistic historiosoph historiosophical, uh, you know, point of view. And I would say Hesperialism is very optimistic. Okay, so it, it of course, it shows that we have the tragic alternative, either or, but on the other hand, it shows, well, it is possible to restore the order and to, the, the civilization to survive. Mm, and as opposed to those conservatives who say, well, uh, we can do nothing. Uh, we can just uh, look at the civilization that is declining and being destroyed. And, you know, people cannot really stop those uh, processes, huge processes that are taking place. So I would say Hesperialism is very optimistic historiosophically. Uh, it shows that, well, it is possible if only people realize that, we, that there is certain job to be done, okay? And then we can somehow, you know, stop, let's say, the history, the, dy the dynamics of history uh, and restore uh, those rules that, uh, you know, uh, mm, uh, un uh, able, uh, you know, make civilization able to survive. Mm -hmm. So how would you say, is it really a very optimistic view or uh, do you define yourself as an you know, optimist, uh, optimist or rather pessimist? Because I would say you are very optimistic. Perhaps the best term would be uh, heroical pessimism. Oh, because, okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> because, right. because, because in the end, of course, our civilization is doomed. All mm. civilizations mm -hmm. die sooner or later. We are also more or less at the end of our civilization. So th there won't be a new renaissance. There won't be any possibility to again uh, go back to the 15th or 10th or 18th century or whatever and and reinvent ourselves totally so we are towards the end we are if we want to use the analogy of the human body uh, we are in our old age but still that doesn't mean that we have to kill ourselves just because we know that we are mortal all human beings are mortal uh, and still we we manage to survive and it's not that when we are 40 or 50 that we say well now we will soon soon die so just let, let, let let's make suicide uh, people rather than try to, to think what can we do with the biologically sometimes reduced possibilities we still have and with uh, the, the impending da death, how can we still make some, some sense of it? And that is, that is more or less the model I would like to promote and based on, of course, on cultural comparatism, it shows that the last word is not yet said and that it is up to us to shape this last word and to be sure that it is at least said with some dignity and with some, let's say, courage and pride of our own historical past than, than, than with Wimper, which is, which is what is the, uh, happening for the moment. Of course, there's the, the political side, the one I tried to, to show with Hesperialism, uh, but also we know that during the next 10, 20 years, uh, the possibility of such, a, let's say, final restoration is, is limited. We are now entering a period of great crisis, great political crisis, economic crisis, cultural crisis, uh, and this, this will be a long fight. Some countries, like I hope uh, Poland, will perhaps manage to, to to, to remain uh, uh, somehow on the more culturally conservative and patriotic sides. Others may tumble into disaster, perhaps even some form of civil un unrest, perhaps even civil war, as President Macron uh, said some years ago about, about France. And so it is, it is all important that people even in a situation where they know that they do not have any immediate uh, chance of political success, nevertheless cling to their ideals and adapt them to modernity and remain somehow proud of their history and, and loyal also to their past, which is uh, why, why I wrote this recently, this, this, this book called uh, Que Faire, you, you spoke about it in the, in the intro, it has just been published some, some days ago uh, in, in, in Polish under the title uh, Zorobic with a, a title design which I have to, to, to admit is not mine and which is probably not what I would have liked to have chosen, but which 
shows, of course, the, the basic idea that we need to, to defend ourselves against the, 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 the risk of, a, of an inner dissolution of our civilization. And even in the case where there is no immediate political future, uh, we need still to live in our daily life an exemplary form of conservative, traditional, but still constructive uh, uh, existence. And how that could look like, that is what I've tried to, to show in these 24 chap chapters. But they are, of course, much more addressed, I would say, to, to a French or German audience uh, um, than, than to a Polish audience where many of these risks are, are not yet that present than in, in Western Europe. But at least it may s serve as some form of apotropaic uh, Uh, let's say uh, um, uh, message uh, uh, helping perhaps also the Polish uh, uh, public to, to see uh, where history might be heading for them uh, if they do not remain loyal to their, to their own identity, to their own values, to their own history. I would like to ask you about the notion you often write about, namely oikophobia. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain the intellectual roots of uh, this uh, typically, probably typically Western phenomenon uh, and why it's so dangerous for civilization as, you know, something that comes from inside and not from outside. Absolutely. Uh, as you said, the main danger for the survival of the Western civilization doesn't come from outside. It's not the risk of, of, of mass migration, of Islamization, of Russian attack, of Chinese uh, competition. Uh, that is the, the main menace for our identity, but this menace comes from, from, from within. If we are solidary, if we are patriotic, if we cling to our identity, if we want to defend it even under occupation and so forth, we will survive in the end. Uh, but uh, if we dissolve our identity, if we start to hate our innermost being, if we want just to, to drop out of Western civilization or even uh, launch ourselves into the arms of other civilizations, like many people who now become either Muslim or who are Russophile and who would like to be occupied by, by Putin and there are more and more people in France and Germany who think like that, then of course the battle, uh, the battle is lost. Um, now we have to see that in, in every late civilization there is this, 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 this identity crisis as I already alluded to. Uh, so the, the, the dissolution of, of family, of uh, sexual identity, uh, of religion, uh, of patriotism, all that is not necessarily new. It happens uh, time and again in many different civilizations, so it is not typically Western. Of course, what is typically Western is the sheer size of this phenomenon of self-loathing and of, of oikophobia, uh, as you know, that, as, you, as, you, as you termed it, because uh, it is typical, of course, for the Western civilization to exaggerate everything. That is our, our Faustian longing that, that, that makes us always going over, over the top somehow and not respect the uh, Greco-Roman Meden Agan, so uh, remaining somehow in the middle uh, path, so we exaggerate everything and so now for the moment of course we exaggerate also this, this self-loathing. It is based on, 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 on a certain number of, of points. On the one hand, I think it is based on, on the traumatism, of course, of the last uh, decades. There is still the traumatism of the Second World War that is, that is very present in the minds of many people in Western Europe and that has brought them into not just Uh, wanting to come to terms with the crimes of their fathers and forefathers, but that leads them to just condemn the entire Western civilization in order to, to reinvent them anew and to give themselves some form of moral uh, probity and dignity uh, they, they can't assume if they place themselves in the continuity of, uh, of these crimes. But there is also something that, that, that you can see in, in Freud's uh, Unbehagen, uh, mit der, Unbehagen mit der Zivilisation, I think he, he called his book, that is this, this, un, um, uh, this notion 
of uh, being uncomfortable with civilization itself. Our civilization now is old. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is becoming very complex. We have this impression that everything has been said anyway, uh, on one moment or the other. It's difficult to say or to discover something new. Technology also has has reached a point where it is very difficult, uh, uh, like in past ages, just to, to to go into a ship and sail into the unknown and to discover a new island or continent or to discover a new star or that kind of let's say uh, naive uh, discovering uh, feature. We have the, this impression that art has come to its uh, to its end because with modern art and modern music there isn't much more to be said that wouldn't word either into ridicule or into into the pastiche. So it is this impression of, of a civilization that has that has discovered it all, uh, that has gone through thousand years of 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 of, of history, uh, where where now everything is said, and uh, that also is a certain weight to be to be born by people to be, and uh, that can also put people in saying in saying well this this civilization is is old it's gone I don't want it anymore I rather want to drop out to invent myself uh, or just to to enjoy myself and all that of course brings. Uh, with it, this 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 post uh, historical being, Spengler once uh, ter termed it the fella, uh, in analogy to the uh, Egyptian uh, peasants, who even long after the end of Pharaonic Egypt continued to till their soil and to restore some of their their temples, even though they they couldn't understand uh, it any, anymore, even though they were under the rule of the Greeks and the Romans and the Arabs. And and the, the, the Persians and so forth. And still they continued patiently to, to work without being historical subjects anymore. And that is what is happening now. People are becoming post-historical uh, beings. They reject their civilization uh, on different grounds uh, and they, they, they just want to, to have their peace and not to be confronted with this immense heritage that can be indeed uh, extremely heavy on the shoulders of someone who recognizes, uh, of course, the responsibility uh, that, uh, that comes with it. Speaking of uh, Spengler, because um, you are a well-known expert of, uh, when it comes to Spengler's uh, thought, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, and you partly answered already this question, uh, where do you agree with Spengler? And this part, let's say, we, we already know. And if there are any theses you actually do not agree with Spengler and you think he was wrong about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as you said, the general idea uh, that Spengler puts forth in the decline of, of, of the West is, is, is this, the, the, the double idea that civilizations behave in a parallel way and that the West arrives more or less at the, at, at the end of its evolution. I think both ideas are absolutely valid. And by the way, they are not absolutely new. There are many people who said that in the 19th, in the 20th century. Even in classical antiquity, uh, people had, had partly the same idea and tried to show how civilizations or cities behaved in analogy to the human bodies and that their present, for example, the late Roman Republic was already the old age of classical antiquity. So um, many of, of, of Spengler basic insights are not new. They belong to a very old tradition. What is new in Spengler is the detail with which he tried to, to overcome the limitation of this comparison on the modern West and classical antiquity, but also extended it to Chinese history, to Indian history, to Egyptian history, and so forth. Um, and uh, there, there are many interesting partial insights in that, uh, which I really appreciate as an historian, there are also many problems. I tried in some of my recent books also on, on, on Spengler uh, to, to, to sketch how his vision of, for example, uh, Iranian history, partly also of Chinese history uh, and so forth, need to be re-evaluated and need to be corrected in details. Not, not when it comes to the general idea, but there are many details and the, the 
precise location of these uh, historical faces uh, which he delineates which are I think uh, uh, incorrect that is that is one point where I defer in, in details with Spengler I also assume more civilizations than than Spengler uh, he uh, surmised the existence of, of eight civilizations I see rather 15 uh, but uh, these are these are details somehow um, another point where I defer from Spengler um, is, uh, let's say, uh, the uh, moral attitude of Spengler. Spengler was very, um, let's say, shaped by, by Nietzsche uh, and by Nietzsche's elitism. So Spengler sees essentially history as um, the result of the action of, let's say, more aristocratic individuals. He, he has some form of Nietzschean contempt for the victims of history. I don't like that facet of Spengler. There is this, this elitist, this aristocratic, this uh, misanthropic outlook on history where uh, there, there, there's, a, there, there's a lack of compassion somehow in, in Spengler. And, and that is something also I, I, I don't like. Of course, um, saying that an author or that the, the theory of an author lacks in compassion doesn't invalidate it. Uh, his nature also lacks compassion. Obviously, if we look at what is happening in the survival battle in the jungle, so saying, well, there's not much compassion happening in the, in the, 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 the battle of, for, for survival is not an argument against it. So that, that's, of course, also the problem of my attitude towards Spengler. I would somehow uh, put some, some accents on other places and try to uh, let's say, have a little more vision of mankind and of history uh, that would put the accent not just on uh, some, some aristocrats, some elite, some, some ubermenschen somehow, uh, but rather also on, 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 on the masses of the people, on the suffering of people, on the fact that history is suffering, that we need to be compassionate about that. And the third point, uh, which is perhaps the most important point, though it's perhaps a bit, uh, bit theoretical, uh, is that uh, Spengler's vision of history uh, is very vitalist. Uh, so uh, like Schopenhauer, like Goethe, Uh, like Nietzsche, uh, like Simmel, uh, he was a vitalist. Uh, that is, he saw that the principle of life uh, is in fundamental opposition to unorganic principles of matter. And so this is some form of, of life mysticism. So he sees civilizations as human beings, as being the, the incorporation of some principle of life, which is defined by, by birth, growth, uh, adulthood, decline, and death. Uh, but he, he doesn't really reflect on the metaphysical basis of, of this, this principle of life. Where does it come from? How does it tie to the question of the one and the many? What does it say about our, the, the, the aim of our life? What is the aim even, even of history? Spengler can only say, like Nietzsche, uh, finally, that the only aim of history is basically an aesthetical aim. It's, it, it, it's, it's beautiful somehow, but it remains a mystery. There isn't any, any sense beyond even all big questions about about God, about the meaning of life and the universe and everything uh, is, is just seen uh, from a formal point of view by Spengler as a, as a succession of different questions with formal answers that differ from civilization to, to civilization but they do not have any form of, of inner meaning. And I'm trying also in the new book I'm writing where I'm trying to, to remake basically Spengler from, from A to Z and um, to show how um, the different answers given to these ultimate questions by the different human civilizations uh, have also some form of analogy, of parallelism that enable us also to approach the ultimate question that is what is this one principle that is good and that is beautiful and that is just and that is unique. How can we manage to define that? What is the part of this leading principle in ourselves, in our souls? How can we define that? What does it imply also for our understanding of the universe? And how can these different Uh, worldviews developed by the Chinese, by the Europeans, by the Greeks and Romans, by the Egyptians, help us in better understanding it. Because Spengler, for Spengler, these different 
uh, tentatives to define what is God and the divine, uh, these different attitudes just lead to some form of relativism. Basically, he says, well, they're all different somehow, so we can just analyze that from an aesthetical point of view. And my approach would be that, yes, they are different, but there are different viewpoints arranged around the same entity. And so they see different facets of this entity. So it's, it's, it's the same God, basically. It's the same principle of truth and beauty uh, that is seen by the Chinese, by the Greeks, by the Europeans, but from a different perspective. And if we add together all these perspectives, we get also an overview over this one principle uh, that is uh, much more complete than the one we can win from our own civilizational standpoint. And so as a result of such a comparative morphology of history, we can also develop some form of philosophy, not just of history, but also even a philosophy as such, as we can aggregate all the different responses given by the different uh, civilizations. We can show how their dynamics function and so somehow uh, distill, uh, you could say, they synthesize uh, also much more complete answers to these questions. That is something that Spengler didn't do. He, he remained uh, somehow at the brink, let's say, of this more philosophical, perhaps transcendent uh, uh, questioning. And I try to use rather the Spenglerian method as a potential stepping stones for such more philosophical answers. Would you agree with the, my proposition for conclusion of our uh, today's talk that uh, even though the history is somehow determined, it has certain phases that simply has to have to happen, uh, we still need to be heroic, as you said, uh, and you know present heroic attitude towards history, uh, knowing, of course, that the you know, what has to happen will happen. Do you agree with such conclusion? Absolutely, absolutely. I couldn't have put it, uh, put it better. We need to fulfill our role. And even if we do not choose this age where we have been, been born, Spengler once said something very similar, of course, uh, we have to, to, to accept it. Uh, as I said, uh, even when we are 60, 70, 80 years old, we need to, to fulfill our role. When we are 80, we are not 20 anymore, so we can't do the same things. Uh, but still, we have to, to, to play our role. There are many things still to be discovered, many important things we need to do. And another aspect um, Spengler never uh, really also wrote about, neither did, did Toynbee or many others, is that um, our responsibility is not just for us. It is, of course, also for our children, for our for our uh, the next generations, uh, to whom we need to give uh, this this heritage. Because everything we are, everything we do, everything uh, that is constituting uh, Europe for the moment is nothing uh, is not something that we have shaped. It is something that we have received from 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 dozens of generations of people before us who loved, who worked, who who fought in order to, to build this, this, this magnificent European civilization. So this gives us also a huge duty to, to pass it over as unscathed as possible to, our, to the next generation so that they too can enjoy within the morphological limits, of course, uh, of, uh, uh, of this heritage. And it's not just about our, our immediate descendants. Um, if you look at history, we have many phenomena uh, where um, civilizations may be dead for many centuries, but still exert a certain role and can help also future civilizations. Look, for example, at Europe. With Without uh, the heritage of classical antiquity, uh, it would have been extremely difficult in the 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th century uh, for, for Europe to redefine itself. It's just because they had access again to the huge literature and knowledge and know-how and tradition of classical antiquity that the West could also have this rapid breakthrough. They didn't have to invent everything again. And many things of classical antiquity is still surviving uh, today thanks to the effort of the Roman Empire in, in conserving these elements. We can say the same about the classical Chinese civilizations, civilization without 
the effort of the two Han uh, dynasties, uh, it would have been extremely difficult then after the barbarian incursions uh, uh, and all the crisis of the first half of the first millennium uh, uh, AD for then afterwards the Tang uh, dynasty to emerge again and to use this knowledge and to use this heritage in order to, to, to stabilize uh, its civilization and to create a new more Buddhist uh, Chinese civilization. So there are many examples also of that. So even uh, though the West is mortal, that doesn't mean that world history ends uh, and that doesn't mean that we just have to, to look away and relinquish our duty. Our duty continues even after the death, we can say, of our own civilization, which is why I think that this, this uh, let's say, uh, heroic pessimism or determinist optimism uh, is probably uh, the, let's say, most realist, but at the same same time also idealist attitude we as modern conservatives can can assume today professor david david engels historian philosopher of history thank you very much thank you very much for your invitation stay tuned uh we'll be uh, uh we'll see each other in the next uh editions of our program thank you very much